dollars the United States paid to help fund the UN body last year. Funding Donald Trump has now cut. The Rolling Stones, Lady Gaga and Billie Eilish all played sets. It'll be shown on Irish TV later tonight. It's two minutes past three. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. Need to renew your AA home insurance? Go to the aa.ie slash myAA. The odd sunny spell developing in some parts as the day goes on. Showers on the way later, starting in the west and southwest. Top temperatures of 11 to 15 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball with Paddy Power, the greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. I'm prepared to end it like that. Do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Now you're welcome along. So we've got a brilliant guest to chat to over the next hour or so. 53106 is the text number. You'll get us at Off The Ball on Twitter if you want to put a question to a man who's played the two World Cups, who's uh, been at the Euros for Ireland in 88, whose club career, frankly, is probably underappreciated in this country in many ways. 15 years at Liverpool, where he won the league in 1982, 1983, 1984. 1986, 1988, 1990. He won the FA Cup in 1986 and 1989. He scored in the League Cup final win of 1982. He scored in the League Cup final win of 1983. He also was part of the League Cup winning side in 1984. He won the European Cup in 1984 to boot. And as I said, 15 years playing for a fairly phenomenal Liverpool side, all the way from home farm before that. Delighted to say Ronnie Whelan is with us on the line. Hi, Ronnie, how you doing? I'm great, Joe. How are you? Very well, very well. Where do you keep all those medals? Um, locked away somewhere. Actually, it wasn't long ago. The, the bank got in touch with me and said, you've got to take the Allied Irish in Liverpool, actually. They said, you've got to take all your belongings there with the bank for some reason. So they're back at home with me. OK. It's quite the haul, isn't it? I mean, do you, like, I, I probably have taken it for granted a little bit. I knew you were part of this brilliant Liverpool side, but you almost have to remind yourself that you were there for 15 years, uh, effectively for pretty much all the good years. Yeah, there was lots of great times in there, Joe. It was, it was for a lad that grew up in Finglas, it's it's like a real, real dream come true to just go over there and start playing professional football in the first place. But um, yeah, to come out of it at the end with all the trophies and all the great times was, was brilliant. Where are you based now? You're near Liverpool, are you? Yeah, about half an hour outside in Southport. Did you ever think um, about going home to Dublin, to Finglas, to Ireland? I yeah, early, early doors. Um, but then you get married to a Scouse girl, you have kids that grow up in Southport, um, and the time just goes then. And it's 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 actually it's like a lot of footballers here because there's a, a group of footballers here: Doug Leash, Hanson, Beglin, Lawrence, and Steve McMahon. We all Gary Gillespie. We all live in the same area, about two miles from each other. We don't see each other that often. Maybe on the golf course now and again, but we've all decided to stay in England. You must feel, I presume, or maybe maybe you don't ever lose the kind of pull of home, but like you've lived the majority, the vast majority of your life really over there. Yeah, I moved away when I was just coming up to 18, so I'm like 58 now. So 40 years I've been here. I was only 17 and a half years in Dublin, mm. but uh, Dublin's always home. I, I, I come home on the plane, and honestly, I, I swear to you, I do. I, I As the plane comes into Dublin Airport, I do honestly say to myself, I'm home. Yeah. Mm. Do you still do you feel very at home in Liverpool though, and where you are? Yeah, that, of course you do. After all this time, you know, the, as I say, the kids grown up here. Um, yeah, this is a place where I've, I've become very accustomed to, and the people have been great to me over the years. Mm. Um, I've really enjoyed it here, and there's no way I'll, I'll be moving from here. Yeah. Uh, we see you doing your punditry work, obviously. How big is football in your life now? Are you still obsessed with the game, love watching the game, watch every game you can, or does it have its place? It has its place, and it's, it's second to golf, to be fair. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a great watcher of football. I do watch, I watch a lot of Liverpool games. I do games for Liverpool TV as well. Mm. So I see plenty of games, but... Um, I'm, I'm not a great watcher. I, I would, I honestly would. I'd rather play golf on a Saturday than go to, to watch a football match. But I do like catching up on old football. Have you always been that way? Would you have been like that on a, as a player? No, not at all. Football was the be all and end all from when I was a kid. That was all I ever wanted to do. I grew up watching my dad when he played at Drogheda more so. He played at Pat's early doors. Um, but more so at Drogheda, I'd watch him. I'd go on the bus with him. Me and my brother Paul would go on the bus to the games. And that was um, 
that was my football grounding on what you see and what you do and how you see things on the bus with all the players after the game. And it was something I just wanted to do. And then my whole thing was, this is all I want to do. I want to play football. I told my mum and dad early on, I want to go to England and play football. Mm. Um, my dad believed in me, whether my mum or anybody else believed in me as much as my dad. But yeah, but it was all I ever wanted to do was go to England. Okay. And is it almost post-retirement that the love of watching it has dwindled slightly? Is that when it started to change a bit for you? Um, yeah, I did, I did a couple of stints at management after I played. Mm. Um, and then I couldn't... I, I, it was like, I don't know how people, the likes of Alex Ferguson, even Sam Allardyce, Kane Aglish over the years, how they can just go for so long being a football manager because it's the most pull your hair out every week mm. you you are you're dependent on 11 players every week and if they don't do it it's your job is on the line and then I, I started to I wasn't a great lover of football then it was just getting to me too much so punditry was I'm, I'm happy to do happy to talk about it um, and I enjoy it very very much mm. when you say it was getting to you too much the stress the anguish the pressure not worth it that was the way I felt in the end um and there was times when, when I felt I was having doing a good job, even at South End. I was sixth in the league at Christmas, and two centre backs, a game against Norwich away, two centre backs get injured who had been playing magnificently. The chairman then doesn't help you out. I don't know if he ever wanted to, to get promoted or, or not, but um, that killed us off that season. Mm. Then I go to Cyprus and I manage out there. We've got four games to go and second in the league, and I get sacked for whatever reason. And then all that gets, gets to you. And. Um, I just thought, what's the, what's the point in doing it? There's no point. It, 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 it's a thankful, thankless job. It really is. For, it must be from 98 to 99% of managers, an utterly thankless job where you're just counting down your days till you're sacking. But the, the, the thing is, there's, there's some managers out there who, who believe, well, if I can get two good sackings, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. I, I was never... I, that was not for me. I did not want to be sacked anywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, because you, you just... I would have, I've would seen it as complete failure if you get sacked. But I, I, I got sacked with three games to go when I was second in the league and things like that get to you. So, mm. yeah, that was the end of me. Well, it could it, that, that, kind of stuff, that kind of stuff could turn you bitter if that happened a few more times very very easily. Yeah, but I wasn't getting a, like a £5 million payoff. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, um, it was a nice little job in Cyprus. Um, the weather was great. The kids were happy in school. The missus was happy. Um, and it was all going okay, but then when something like that happens, you think, what, what, is, what is really the point? I'm right, Ronnie, in saying that your dad played twice for Ireland. Was it two caps for Ireland? He got two caps for Ireland, yeah. Um, I've still got them downstairs in my little snooker room in the house. Um, he also scored against the, the English League in, I think it was 62, at, at Daily Mount, to beat the English League 2-1. My dad scored a winner. So, yeah, it was, that's, it, it was all through... Me dad all the way through was was just football, football, football. He never pushed me really that much into it. I, I wanted to do it all the time on my own. He, you know, they'd give you little things. Go, go on, go, go outside and see if you can keep it up twenty times. So I go out and I'd come in two hours later. Say so I kept it up twenty times, and he said, "Now go do it on your left foot." So I'd go back out, but I was happy to do it. It mm. wasn't like he was shouting at me saying, "Get outside and play football." I was always happy once there was a ball somewhere near me. And was he full-time footballer or was he working as well? No, he was never. He was working in Unidair up in Finglas. Right. He was working in Unidair the day he scored against the English League. He had to go um, from work to play the game and then go into work next morning. So it was, um, oh. it was a different day, wasn't it? And what kind of upbringing was it in Finglas for you? Great. Loved it. Um, it's got its bad name, Finglas, as well. But um, no, all my, all my childhood in Finglas was, was, yeah, no problems. Pretty remarkable. Everybody was great. We, everybody got on well. I used to live in a little cul-de-sac up in Fingers West, um, nicknamed the Keyhole. But um, great, great times. Great. I, I love my. I love growing up in Dublin. I, I was very, very sad to leave Dublin, but it was always from a very young age. So I said, I want to play football in England. It seemed. I was doing a bit of reading last night. It seemed like you were hot property as a teenager. Like you were on trial several times at United, Everton were sniffing around, or, or cert, sorry, maybe not Everton, the Celtic were, Everton I think were as well. I read United offered you uh, an apprenticeship at 15. Yeah. There was a keenness in the family for you to do your leaving. Yeah, my dad more, more than anything. Um, I, my dad was away, I think, at 18. He went to Chelsea on trial. Right. 
and he was after a week or so he was very very homesick and, and came back um, I'd been at Man United from 12, 14, 14, 15 I was always at Man United every school holiday training they offered me an apprenticeship at 15 but my dad said go just just finish school and I, you know I was a 15 year old Man United I call him for you I want to go as a Man U fan I want to go and he said no, we, no I'm not letting you you're just going to finish and leaving um, then we will see what happens. But I, I said that nobody else will come back in, but he honestly he said to me, somebody will come back in for you. Wow. So after Man United, Man United then didn't come back in when I was like, at the time I was supposed to sign pro, which was at 18. But I had a two-week trial at Liverpool and they asked me to sign then. So more than happy. I think that decision is a credit to your father. Like he must have understood the potential traps of trying to make it in England and having no education to fall back on. He didn't want that for you. No, and I think in the the last few years, we've seen an awful lot of people, of kids coming back to Dublin, haven't they, when they've gone away to mm. to the to the big time in England. And it, it, it's if you go away at 15, you come back at 17, not getting a, not getting a pro contract. You've, you seem to have missed two years of your life because you've been away trying to become a footballer. You come back as, and, and honestly, you, you must be so disheartened that everybody has seen you go away and you're going to be the great footballer and then to come back home um, it must be very very difficult and I, I was I was fortunate that I, I hung on see I was also fortunate that I then sort of got in at 16, 17 into home farms force team so I wasn't playing against 15 year olds anymore 16 year olds I was playing against grown men mm. um, the likes of Joe Book at Bowes who was a big big centre back and I'm a kid playing centre forward you're frightened to death but um, it toughened me up in those in those years. Yeah, because it I, toughened me up actually to go away mentally, also to go away. Right. And the stick I, I you would take from all the all the, the Liverpool lads that were there as apprentices have come through all their apprenticeship. They're now getting close to being a pro. And then this Irish fella comes in who's on more money than them, and now everything's you know it's just they're all against you in training and you've got to be mentally very very tough to get through and I probably wouldn't have got through at 15. Mm, okay that's very interesting because uh, for younger listeners home farm were playing in the League of Ireland so you were still playing yeah. at, a, at a really good standard at 16 and just one last question on your education were you uh, good at school like uh, so, some I was average. Average I was, okay. Yeah. I, I, I probably would have done better in me leaving if I had stayed and studied a bit more but again it was football out the back yeah. before we were supposed to be studying. What, but, um, what kind of player were you in your teenage years? Like that is a lot of interest from United to Liverpool, uh, Celtic, Everton, playing League of Ireland at 16. Were you were you clearly a, a special talent? Your dad obviously thought you were if he was certain I, the teams would come back for yeah, you. Yeah, I think yourself, you don't know. Do you? you know people are asking you to go over and go on trial. And um, Well, are you running rings at home farm? I, I'm... I'm I'm scoring a lot of goals. I, I, I was more of an inside forward. I'm scoring a lot of goals and I'm doing a lot of good things. Okay. But I, I, you don't... I, yourself, you don't get it. You know, you, you just want to play football and you want to play as well as you can. And, um, you know, if I played bad, I'd go home and, and my dad would look at me and, and he'd go, listen, you, you weren't great today. Right. He said, well, you're still the best player on the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sort of kicked you down but picked you up again. <laughs> He seems so, like a, he seems like he was a shrewd enough operator. Your father, and he was, yeah, with with, with, with me, yeah, and the football was, and the whole thing of um, doing things right because he played, he knew a bit about it. But yeah. doing things right, like not going to school discos and things like that. I'd come down on a on a Friday with a game on a Saturday, at 15, 16 years of age, and you go, oh, I'm going to school disco, and and all he said to me was, okay, if you feel you're going to make you a better player tomorrow, you go to disco. Yeah. And I'd, I thought, oh, why? <laughs> so I'd go back upstairs, change, and stay in and watch the TV. Mm. It was all football. Did you stay at Diggs when you went over to Liverpool first? Yeah, right by, um, right, probably about 50, 60 yards from the gates at Anfield. Good, Anfield dig, good, good digs or bad digs? Yeah, they were great. They're the only, <laughs> but I, I felt they were very, very good until you stay there for a, a little bit. And they had a, um, they had a parrot, actually, in the, in the house. And they had a big, you go for sleep in the afternoon, and they had a big um, Alsatian dog as well. If somebody come to the door, I'm sleeping in the afternoon, getting ready for the game in the, in the night, and someone comes to the door, the doorbell goes, the dog starts barking at the door, and this parrot keeps screaming out, sit down, whiskey, sit down, whiskey. <laughs> Every time I went to go for a sleep. But um, yeah, I, I then, 
I stayed there for a few years. Um, Mrs. Pike, she was great. Right. And then I moved down the road a couple of years later to a lady called Mrs. Edwards, who Alan Hansen had stayed in, and Kevin Sheedy was there at the time, staying there. Right. So I moved into the same digs as Kevin Sheedy. I was very, very lucky as well when I went to Liverpool, because when I went to Liverpool, you, the first team, we got trained at Anfield, or we got changed at Anfield, sorry, and then we all head down to Melwood on a bus. Mm. The first team always, the first team squad, were in the home team dressing room at Anfield. The, all the apprentices and the reserves were in the away team dressing room. When I went into that dressing room as an 18-year-old, there was three Irish lads there, and they were all from Finglas. Brian, Brian Duff, Dundalk, who, who lived in Finglas near me, a lad called Simon Bradish, also from Finglas, and a lad from Finglas, he's called Derek, Derek Carroll. And I went into that dressing room very, very lucky because I could sit down between three Irish lads and be able to talk to them. I didn't go in there with nobody that I knew. These three lads were there, and it really, really helped me that they were there when I went over. Wow, that's extraordinary, all from Finglas. Why is that? Yeah. Mm, um, uh, Simon Bradish got a couple of caps for Ireland. Um, I think Brian and, and Simon and Derek, maybe, more at Dundalk they played yeah. when they came back. And had you even kick and ball together back in Finglas, or did you not know each other? Well, Brian, I went to the same school as Brian Duff. So me, when Duffer was, when we, we used to do our supposed, um, when you're supposed to be going there and um, looking at the books and, and, <laughs> and studying, mm. we would end up going outside the back in school and I'd get all the lads out and we'd have a game out the back. Yeah, Duffer was was playing for the uh, Patrician College in Finglas we both went to. He was playing for the, the, the team as well. The, the, from the school, so yeah, I knew I knew Brian well. God, that's great comfort because I, I I've, I've no doubt that the Liverpool lads didn't welcome another threat to them making it through uh, with open arms, you know. So another it takes, you, it takes you a little bit as a yeah. young lad from Ireland going over there to think what's really going on. They're very very nice to your face, and then they, you know, it happens that. But I'm sure it happens everywhere. Hmm. They have a little go, a little snidey remark behind your back, and then. You're getting in the team before them, or you're getting in the reserve team before them, and then it starts to get a little bit of a little bit of needle in training, and and then you've got to be, as I say, mentally tough, but also physically tough. You've got to put up with it. And you mentioned your dad had a bit of homesickness when he went to Chelsea. Were you were you okay, or how did you find it? Terrible. I was okay for a while, but then um, I I was in the reserves, and then I wasn't in the reserves, and then I was finding it really really hard. But I think that the main reason I was finding it hard was because I kept going home. You know, because I was feeling I'm missing home. And I had four flights a year from Liverpool. They paid for four flights a year. So I would play a game in the A team on a Saturday morning. I'd fly home to Dublin Saturday afternoon and get back on the first flight back on Monday morning for training. Yeah. But then it was just horrible trying to come back again. You know, I'm going home. And then after about six months, well, sorry, after a little bit of time, my dad said, again, my dad. And he went, right, look, that's it. He said, you're not coming home for six months. He said, you just stay there. You stick it out. Um, and the best thing I ever did, right. I started getting stronger. I started training better. I started getting back in the reserve team. I started scoring goals. And then um, all because I, I I was so homesick. But then my dad stepped in and said, OK, stay away for six months. And that killed me as well, staying away for six months. Mm. But um, it, it made me stronger and it made me better. I've never lived away from uh, Dublin, Kildare, and the... Kildare man, but I never, never lived away from home. Like I understand what homesickness is when you say it, but what? Mm. How does homesickness manifest itself for you on a Tuesday night in Liverpool or a, or, a, or a Saturday? Like, what, what is it? Are you, you're, are you crying? Was, or Sunday are you... was Sunday was my worst day. Sunday. They play on Saturday, and all the lads would go for a pint, but then you go back to your dig Saturday night, and then you wake up Sunday, and there's nothing happening. All the other lads that would probably were apprentices but live outside of Liverpool would be gone back to their homes. All the Liverpool lads would be with their families. And I sat in the room on my own all Sunday. That was when it really, really got to me. That was when I was wanting to sit there listening to rebel songs, crying on my own in the room. It really, really got to that stage, mm -hmm. thinking I would I want to be back on a Sunday because Sunday was great at home. The family, everybody's around you. you you all have Sunday lunch, and but I wasn't having any any of it. So that that was the worst day for me. Sunday, as soon as I could get by, mm. but Sunday was just just hit you. God, that's it's, that's it's such a sad image that some lad alone in tears in his room listening to music. 
know. It seems like a really, really sad story, mm, doesn't it? It is. But I mean, it, is way, it, was the way, it was the way I felt at the time. And I'm sure there's many, many kids that have gone away as well to Liverpool or other places um, and all feel the same way. You, you, you take a little bit of comfort from some music because there's not an awful lot of comfort around you. Mm. Uh, there's a text in from a Phil Lyons in Wexford who says, I was there behind the goal when Ronnie's dad scored against the English League. So there's somebody who remembers it. And uh, there's a Chris who is living in Carlo now. Uh, tell Ronnie his dad used to come in for his petrol in the Texaco garage on the Ballygall Road in the early 90s and he was an absolute gentleman. I was a young petrol pump attendant at the time, says uh, Chris there with a the memory. So there you go. People are listening. Yeah, any, nice. Any uh, questions for Ronnie? Five three one zero six. Can I can I sum up this uh, unbelievable period then, and you can tell me what jumps out at you? So just for younger listeners, it takes you maybe eighteen months to get your place in the first team, and this is just an incredible team. So nineteen eighty two, Liverpool win the league. Uh, Ronnie, you scored fourteen goals that year. The team were mid-table Christmas, 11 straight wins later that year. And then in the League Cup final, you scored twice as well. So that's a League and a League Cup final win. The following year, 1983, you win the League again. You win the League Cup final again. You also score in the League Cup final again at Wembley. The following year, 1984, you win the League again. You win the League Cup again. And then just for the crack, you win the European Cup. So mm -hmm. that is a hell of a first three years in first-team football. So, like, are you... Are you a rock star around Liverpool then? Are you, have you moved into the big house? Have you got uh, every girl in Liverpool chasing you? Are you got the hair slicked back? Is this just the dream? Uh, yeah, it would have been a dream if that all happened. As, <laughs> as not, the, not the winning the games and the medals, but all the girls and all that. No, it wasn't, it wasn't actually a real rock star image. I, I, because I was a younger, younger lad coming into the team, yeah. the big stars were still there. Soon as Doug Leach... Phil Neal, Alan Hansen, um, Terry McDermott. Ray Kennedy was still there early on. I took Ray's position in the end. These were the these were the big times, or the big heads, as Ronnie Moran used to call them. Um, so I was just a part of that whole. Really, actually, probably till Graham soon as left. For them, after them three years, I was part of a, a very very strong squad, mm. very very strong team. It's it's sort of a little bit later where you start to realise that. I am part of this, something yeah. special. Yeah. Um, you, you sort of sat back, me and Rushy, Ian Rush came into the team with me around that time. You sit back in the dressing room and we, and we giggle and talk to each other more than we would to Suey and Kenny and all that. So we had our own little, our own little thing. Mm. But the big, the big boys were the ones who get, they would take all the stick as well. You know, when we when we got beat by Man City in the, in the when you mentioned earlier we were twelfth in the league, we got beat by Man City at home. Uh, three one uh, Stevens Day, and after the after the game, me and Rushy were excused from a big meeting they had, and it was Joe Fagan, just took it from away from Bob Paisley and just went berserk, right. and we were not privy to that. Me and Rushy, we were kept away from that. It was it was all the, as I say again, the big heads he was wanting to have a go at. You know, you're not doing your jobs anymore, and. And I think we got beat twice then after that in the rest of the season. It, it's sometimes uh, talked about as a tough dressing room, like no prisoners taken, a lot of slagging. Uh, did it cross a line or was it an enjoyable place to be? No, it was great. Right. It was great fun. Never, never, never crossed the line. Maybe some people would think it crossed the line, but amongst us, yeah. in that dressing room, it wasn't. We, it was never anything bad said to anybody. Everybody... Got the Mickey taken out, and Rushy got the, the Mickey taken. Rushy couldn't handle it. No, I was fair. I was fair enough. I walked off a duck's back, right. know, but Rushy just couldn't handle it. There went Kenny and Suey, and the more he couldn't handle it, the more he'd take the Mickey out. But um, he came through it. He, it, it. It was sometimes a bit harsh, but Rushy came through it and become one of the greatest goals, or the, the greatest goal scorer ever for Liverpool. And. Did you, like 14 goals in that 1982 season, your first main season, I know you did play in 81, a, a game or two, but 82 is where you really kind of make your mark. Were you, was it a sudden realisation or did it take a while for you to look around and think, geez, I can compete at this level, I'm okay here, I'm doing quite well here, I'm, I, I belong at this level? I think it was just on the crest of a wave at the time. Right. And, I, and being 19, 20 years of age, you think, this is great, this yeah, just I'll just train and then I'll go out and play and then I'll score and it's, it, it just becomes um, 
you just get carried away by the whole thing. You, you, you feel, obviously, you do feel the pressure at, at times it's because Liverpool were always under pressure to win things. Mm. But um, I can't say I ever really felt pressure myself because I was a young flit. I'm not really supposed to be here, but I am here, so I'm going to make the most of it and do what I can. So, um, no, it was, it was it was great times around there. The, yeah. the, the, the crowd at times weren't great because there was nothing. There was a probably unemployment in Liverpool was very, very big at the time. So uh, the fans, if we had three games or three home games in a month, the last game you would see probably 10, 12,000 there. How yeah, was that right? It wasn't like full every day. Nobody had the money to be able to go and go to every game. Right, I hadn't realised that. Mm, yeah, there was, I'd look back on some games and I could say a League Cup final against somebody in midweek would have 10,000, 12,000 at the game. Just the money wasn't there. Mm, yeah. And in terms of what you did on the pitch, like we all, we, we hear about the famous training sessions and it's, you know, five asides and it's touch and pass and move. Now, we, like today, everything, you know, it's so choreographed, like a team will press and it's, you know, everyone has, has a, a, almost a pre-planned action, especially without the ball. In terms of how you as a team played your football, it seems like it was a lot more instinctive and there was an element amongst the management of go out and do it yourselves. Um, what we realised was, or I realised later on, was that a lot of um, the stuff we did in training was actually geared up towards closing down and, and doing all these things. Right. But we um, we didn't realise, well, I didn't realise it till a lot later on. Yeah. It, it, oh, I think we may have lost you. We've lost the picture. I tell you what, I'm due an ad break anyway. We'll take a short ad break and we'll pick things up uh, with Ronnie Whelan in, in just one second. Any text in for Ronnie, 53106. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Jeff and Heskey. The Pat Kenny Show. On tomorrow's programme, designing a test regime for the end of lockdown. Henry McKean reports from Hollis Street, are the banks denying promised mortgages because of a temporary job loss, tales of Bergen Belson, and of course, the breaking news. The Pat Kenny Show, tomorrow morning at nine. On News Talk. The National Standards Authority of Ireland have published a series of business guidance documents to help businesses struggling to deal with the impact of COVID-19. Whether you're a small retailer or a large manufacturer, we can offer you practical steps to help you meet the public health guidelines and reduce the risk of spreading infection. For more information on our guidelines and how to contact us, visit us at nsai.ie. This is an initiative of the Government of Ireland. At Lidl, there's been some changes to ensure the safety of all our customers and staff. But some things haven't changed at all. You can still do your full weekly shop and make great savings on thousands of products. You can still get everything you need to make your family delicious meals all week. And a big thank you to our local suppliers who are still bringing you fresh Irish vegetables and 100% Borbia approved beef, lamb and poultry. Even in uncertain times, you can still rely on Lidl for quality, range and incredible savings. Lidl, more for you. It always feels better to go direct. Sam learned that the hard way when he asked Emily to ask Tom who knew Alan who knew Sarah to ask Emma to the Debs. Uh, Sam who? Uh, going direct is always the best way to go, especially when it comes to switching to Energia and Ireland's cheapest dual fuel bundle. Come to us directly and you'll get the biggest savings with a 35% discount on gas and a 36% saving on electricity. Visit energia.ie. Energia, the power behind your savings. EAB 1,493 euro based on average annual usage, 12-month contract, discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO, levy and carbon tax, T's and C's and early termination fee apply. Valid from January 2020 and subject to change. Verification and T's and C's at energia.ie forward slash EAB. COVID-19 is a major public health emergency here in Ireland and around the world. It's having a big impact on every aspect of our lives. We are now asked to stay at home with limited exceptions. This is especially hard for older people and those who've been advised to cocoon. Being isolated from friends and family is hard for everyone. So right now, it's important that we look out for each other and look after our neighbours. That's why national government, local government and the community and voluntary sectors have all come together to create the Community Call. To make sure that anyone who needs help can get help. And to make sure that people who would like to volunteer in their community can help where they are most needed. If you need help, if you know someone who needs help, 
or if you'd like to offer help, please call 0818 222 024 or call your local authority community call helpline. All the details are live now at gov.ie. Supported by the Government of Ireland. Football on Off the Ball. With Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. Now you're welcome back. So happy to say we have Ronnie Whelan back with us. There's a text in Ronnie from Alar Spencer who says, I was there when Ronnie arrived back to his home house in Finglas after Euro 88. I was 12 years old, looked up to Ronnie as an absolute legend of a local lad who had done good. What a player for club and country. Do you remember that? Do you remember going back to the house after Euro 88? Yeah, there was a, there was a, as I said, I lived in the cul-de-sac and there was a little party on in the in the cul-de-sac and music blared and all over the little, the little <laughs> cul-de-sac. Yeah, it was great. Everybody was out and around, everybody having a drink and a laugh. It was great. I can imagine. So yeah. I, I, we were just finishing off there. You were talking about you know, how the training was probably teaching you things without explicitly telling you what you were working on. What was your game for uh, the, the majority of that period in the 80s? Because I know you were very versatile and I think central midfield almost happened when John Barnes arrived in the scene. But you were on the left wing for a lot of the 80s, were you? Yeah, but it always looked like Kevin Sheedy was going to take over at Ray Kennedy's position, which was on the left side of midfield. Um, but then Ray Kennedy got injured and it was a Friday night game against Stoke City and I didn't expect to be playing, but um, Bob put me in a head of sheets and I scored on my debut. Um, but it was more on that left side of midfield. I was It was more of a holding, just sit and hold your position. It was a lot of, you know, and, and make runs forward, come in round the back when the ball was down the right and things like that. Mm. So it wasn't... Um, it wasn't rocket science to be able to hold a position on the left side of midfield and, and keep things sticking over back there. If Alan Kennedy went forward, I would sit in, stay, wait till he got back. Mm. But it was only, as you say, when, when John Barnes came into the team then, people thought I was probably going to be leaving, but I um, I didn't feel that myself. But obviously, Kenny Daglish didn't feel it either because he put me into the centre of midfield. And that's where I enjoyed my football more than ever. I just, I just loved playing centre midfield. Getting on the ball, dictating things. Yeah, well, there was a lot of more of getting the ball back as well, which, which is, I, I don't know how far it goes back, but I was probably the hold and midfielder, that, that sort of thing. Mm. So I, I sort of break everything down when uh, if people were attacking and then get it forward as quickly as possible into the likes of, I don't know, Rush and Barnes and Beardsley and Ray Houghton Alder when he came. So that was more more my job. It wasn't now any, anymore. Left left side of midfield was you had to score a few goals because you were a midfielder. But to hold the midfield role, I didn't have to score that many goals. Just do that job of holding and, and setting things up. Uh, Paisley seventy four to eighty three, Joe Fagan for those uh, two years, which include the European Cup. You know, a remarkable couple of years Joe Fagan put in, and then Kenny Dalglish eighty five to ninety one. And then Sunes, 91 to 94. We had Mark Lawrence on a while back. He was saying he didn't really love the transition from of Kenny Dalglish into manager. Found it all very, very strange. No, I didn't, I didn't find it that strange myself. The only strange bit was that Kenny would now, when Kenny walked into the dressing room, Kenny was always part of the fun mm. in the dressing room with Sunes and Hanson and all these. But now when Kenny walked into the dressing room, every, everybody went silent because we didn't want Kenny as manager to know where we'd been if we were in the pub, if we were in a nightclub. Um, so we, but other than that, it was no, no, I didn't, I didn't find it that that weird at all. It was just that it was another manager for me. Mm. I've always felt that way. If another manager takes over, what can I do? It's just try and do the same you've been doing and just get on with it. Bob Paisley said something of you. It's a famous quote. I'm sure you've heard it before, uh, but he was saying that when special matches come around and there are medals to be won, and the pundits are asking whether the match winner will be Rushy or Kenny or Brucey. I look past them all towards Ronnie Whelan and I think to myself, there's our man for the big occasion. And you do and did have a reputation for delivering on big occasions. Uh, any particular reason do you feel? You clearly enjoyed the big stage. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed every bit of the football, not, not just the finals and the semi-finals, but for some reason I was one that I scored in a couple of League Cup finals, I scored in a couple of um, semi-finals as well. And... Um, couple of European goals that were that were big against Benfica away I got to in Benfica um, it, it, I don't know why I, I really mm. don't know why it was just something that happened that I, I would 
score um, important goals in important games. In the midst of all this, when the Republic of Ireland, in particular under Jack, start doing uh, great things, Liverpool played a certain brand of football. Jack obviously played a different brand of football. Mm. Yeah. It was successful. It worked. You know, we, we we've we've had that conversation yeah, plenty of times. Were you yeah. were you happy enough to go along with it because it was working and things hadn't worked for Ireland for a long time, or did a part of you feel well with the quality of players we have, we should actually be playing a different and better brand of football? Or were you, were you happy? I, I I was happy. Right. Yes, but yes. I, I also felt that we could have played better football. But like you said, we were getting success, and everybody that was in that squad around that time wanted to be part of it all the time because we were going places and we were qualifying for World Cups and European Championship. But it wasn't exactly the way I, I would have said play football. Mm. And probably the nearest we got with Ireland to playing football like Liverpool played was against USSR in 88. Yeah. When we drew 1-1 one, one when I scored. But for some reason, and I think it was because Russia, they dropped back. But there was no room to get the ball in behind them. And the people that we had on the pitch were clever enough to think, well, we can't get the ball, we can't drop it in behind them. And we kept the ball more, and we created more chances than we'd ever done. Mm. Um, but we only drew the game 1-1. And that probably Jack would go, well, you only drew the game, not playing the way I want you to play. So it was the best football we played against Russia, but um, it mm. wasn't, I'm sure, the way Jack wanted us to play it. That's interesting. So I presume... USSR looked at Ireland and said, well, let's not give them the space in behind and see, can they play? And it turned out you can more than play. Yeah, well, we had, come on, we had the players, didn't we? Yeah. Um, there was some... Well, yeah, some people thought we were just... Even when we played England, people thought, oh, we're here for them, we make up the numbers and we won't uh, make a show of ourselves. But all of us in that squad, in the team that started against England, we, we knew these players and we knew we had every, every chance of beating them. Mm. Which we did on the on the night, but we we had good players. And I always say this: people go, "What what makes success?" I said, "Good players make success. It's not it's not rocket science that these all these great teams that have won loads of trophies mm. have great great players. You look at the, the great Brazilian teams, every, every for all the way back into the seventies and probably poor the back, they had great players. That's why they won World Cups. It's not." I don't, I don't get all this. OK, there is part of me. You have to do training with zones and things like that and where to go. But if you've got good players with a big will to win, you're going to go places. Mm. In the 90s, when Sunas comes in, it's a really famous uh, period for probably the wrong reasons. Um, and I know Sunas rated you incredibly highly. I think he put you in his all-time team not so long ago, you know, and, and uh, like a real player's player and... Maybe he said, he said, and others have said, you were underappreciated by the fans, but the players you played with knew the jobs you were doing, like the way you talked about being on the left-hand side there and tucking in at the right times and covering other people. So the other players and your teammates knew uh, the value of what you were contributing. Under Sunas, did, why did that not quite work? I know he has his version. What's your memory of that period? I guess you were an older player at that stage. Yeah, I was. And that, there was those changes coming, and I had to. There was a lot of us getting a, a bit older. Um... So he wanted to do it his way. Um, but I think he probably... You know, all the, 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 the stuff he took back from Italy, the, the food, um, okay, everyone's diet and what they did, where they drank and, and things like that. Um, but Sui bringing that in was a bit alien to us. And, you know, he, he, he honestly, he brought a, a dietitian in after a, after a training session one day. And she was very serious about the diets and things. And she said, what's the first thing you do after after a match when you get out of the dressing room? And, and Steve Nichols says, well, I have a pint. Mm. And she went, OK, you have a pint after a game, but what do you do after that? And Nichols said, well, I have another one. Mm. And she said, well, when do you eat? Mm. And Nichols said, well, I have a Chinese about half two in the morning. <laughs> but that that was what we did before mm. soon has come. Mm. And so he was wanting to change the whole thing round, but I think he pushed it too early. You know, the likes of people he got rid of, he was getting rid of a lot of the older ones, who I felt may have had a year or a little bit more. Peter Beasley, McMahon, Gary Gillespie, he let Stan Staunton go. And um, I, I, I think he tried to push it too early. His ideas were great. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Suey, I've, I've loads of time for Suey. You'd never like a, a, a manager when he's not, picking it at the right time or he's doing things that you think are silly. Um, I still get on great with Suey, but he, he, for me, he 
got it wrong early on for me at Liverpool. Yeah, right? I, I, I think he's. Ad- I think he's. Ad- I think he's admitted that himself. He tried too much too quickly. Yeah, I, maybe. And I, you know what? I've, I've, I've said it. I wrote, when I wrote my book, I said I would have loved it to to be to go well for Suey. Mm. I would have loved him to come in and, and have us win loads of trophies under him. I thought he was the best player I ever played with Suey. A magnificent player. Um, and I really, I was so happy when he was coming back. I really, really wanted it to work. But for some reason, he, he, he I don't know, he got he did things wrong. Well, I was I was number five. I'd been number five for years. This is a small part of all the things I'm feeling. I was captain at the time. The next thing when Mark Wright come in at centre back, I was injured. And next thing Mark Wright, when the, the season, when the Premiership started with the numbers and the names on the back, Mark Wright was number five, I was number 12, and Mark got the captaincy. But Sue, he never come to me and explained why or what what this was all about, mm. which, which as a captain you would expect a manager to do. But um, little things like that. Little yeah, things like but they're that. important though for the fabric of how everyone's feeling and, and your mood and feeling appreciated yeah. and playing your best stuff. It sounds, it sounds so childish, I'm sure, to some people, but I get it. Yeah, I know. But there's, there was loads of little things. He took me down. I wasn't in the first team squad one day in the morning, Friday morning. I'm not in the first team squad. After training, I'm called into his office. You are in the squad. You're travelling to Chelsea. So I went down to Chelsea, and he didn't even put me on the bench. I, why take me down there and do these things? And that that is what really gets to you more than more than a lot of other things. Mm. But he, that's not what went wrong. But I'm not. I'm talking about personal things that happened with with me. You wonder why they happened, but that wasn't why things went wrong. Yeah. It was just... And, and I'm also... Where the players who came in who Suey signed, where they of the calibre of the players that Suey's played with in his career at Liverpool that were going to win you League Cups and, and FA Cups and, and League titles. But I, maybe that was part of where it went wrong as well. Well, as you said, if you have good players, it takes care of most things, so clearly... Yeah, but that, that's it. I mean, I think, but, but Liverpool haven't won the league for 30 years, mm. But it's, 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 for me, it's a lot of it down to not signing the good players. I was reading um, an interview you did a couple of years ago with Shane Costello on the 42 website, and uh, you were talking about the end at Liverpool. And the end in football is generally brutal. And even if you've had 15 phenomenal years there, the end can be brutal. Um, it was Roy Evans initially, it was a two year deal, then it went back to one year deal, and then the one year deal disappeared. And, uh, from reading the piece, it seemed, from your point of view, like there was just this brutal suddenness to it. You're you're in your car and suddenly it's over as as quick as that. Yeah. Well, the, the thing was, I was offered a year contract, um, and because I'd been there 15 years, and I've, I felt that I was probably due, probably two years. Give me two years. It'll, I'll, I'll still be, I'll be what 33 or something like that when I'm 32 when I finish. So you still have a fair bit of stuff that I can that I can do. Yeah. Um, so I went back to the board, and he said I'll come back to you. He hadn't come back to me, and it, it was just dragging on. And so I went into Evo's office and I said, right, I'll accept the one year. Just give me the one year. I'll get on with it for the year and see where we go after that. And then the I don't know the next few days, Evo called me in his office and said, listen, spoke to the board, told me to take the one year contract, and they have now said there's no contract. And it was a Friday morning. I was supposed to go train them at the first team as well. Oh. And I, I was like, so that's that's it. And he went, yeah, th- there's no contract. So from going out, supposed to be going out to train, I was now in my car driving back home to Southport. And um, it, I, was, I, <laughs> I was probably 10, 15 minutes from home and I've had to, I pulled the car in and I just, um, I, I did, I thought, Crying in the car on my own on the bypass of a of a of a, of a road, and um, you just wonder where's it all. Where it's all been so so great, and now it's come to the end just like this. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got a wife and three kids, and I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I've got to keep earning. Um, but you soon you soon get over it. I got over it quickly enough, and then mm. started looking for teams to try and get some revenue into the house. Did it did it damage your relationship with the club? No, no, because I, I'd seen it happen before. Because you you know it's happening, but it's not happening to you. Sure. See the same things happened to Phil Neal. 
one of the greatest servants at Liverpool Football Club, won more medals than anybody at Liverpool, I think. Same thing happened to him. No, you, that's it. You're no contract, you're gone. Um, so I, I'd seen it, but not took much notice of it until mm. it happens to you, and then you, you then you go, yeah, it's 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 tough. But it's happened to loads before me. It's happened to loads after me. Yeah. So in that sense, it's it's not it's not personal. But at the same time, 15 years, you're probably on some level a part of the shock is you feel 15 years. You might I thought you might treat me a bit better than that. Yeah, that, that's what the whole thing was. You, you, you know, you offered me a year contract. Yes, I was looking for two. But now I said I want one. You could treat me a little bit better than saying, no, you're not having anything now. Mm. So so that was it. Maybe, maybe they, I, I always believe they had, there was a meeting with Edel and the board. And um, if we take him off the wage bill, can we give it somewhere else to younger people coming in? That's the way I probably, the way I would have seen it, the way it was happening. So, they, yeah, they had to make a decision on it. And, that was their decision. It hurt at the time, but you, you understand it. Yeah. Are they good with former players now, Ronnie? Like, would you, no, if you want never, tickets to a game? Really I, think, I think they're a bit better now with Klopp. Um, he seems to embrace it more that ex players are talking about it. But it seemed to be under the Julia and um, Benitez here is that they didn't want much to do with ex players in and around the place saying things about them in. in um, interviews or saying they're not playing bad, they're not playing well, and mm. this is going wrong. They didn't like former players sticking their nose in and, and saying things about them. Right. Um, but if, you were, if you're a pundit, you have to do it, don't you? It's, yeah, no, it's, sure. It's your you, know, you have to say what's happening. You can't tell lies and say everything's rosy if it's not rosy. So would you, if you want to uh, tickets for a game now, would that be no problem? Um, no, that'd be a problem. Would it really? <laughs> yeah, but you can't... You, Again, you understand that you can't give every ex-player a ticket, can you? Um, if, I, if I wanted, I could, I, I'd probably be able to order two tickets to buy, but I'd have to order them like a month in advance or two months in advance. So. And would that be the norm for most former players? Yes, but there's a former players association who are, can make a phone call to somewhere. I haven't, I haven't even gone through it because most of the time you phone up, they're gone. So. I, I can watch it if I if I do Liverpool TV. Oh, yeah. So, um, no, I, that's yeah. So that's yeah. the way it is. Uh, football is a cruel world, isn't it? It can be very cruel. It can be great as well. Sure. There's, there's, there is there is cruel stuff. As as the, probably the cruelest was leaving the football club. Yeah. But um, all the other stuff was great. Great fun. There's a, a text in here. I wanted to touch on this with you. I didn't want to get uh, too into it because it's, it's very sensitive and it's hard to kind of segue out of it. But somebody's wondering about the effects that Heisel and Hillsborough had on uh, Joe Fagan and Kenny. You would have obviously seen. I know, well, Joe Fagan left after, after Heisel, but I, I, I did read that he struggled with that I think he was ready to go. Yeah. yeah. I think he was going to go anyway. Yes, yeah. Joe. Um, no, it took an awful toll on Kenny. Um, Kenny had an awful lot... Um, he was the manager. He took on more than any, any of us. And we all went to funerals. We all went to different funerals that we could get to. Um, but you now you could see it in Kenny. That was really, really. He took it. He took it more. Um, and so was he quieter? Or was he less inclined to laugh? Yeah, I think. I, 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 yeah, I think he was less, a little bit less vocal on the side of the pitch. And I, I, I don't know whether I read somewhere or I heard or he, he said somewhere that he, he, he wasn't making um, decisions as decisively as he, as he, as he was, or was able to do before it. So he felt it was just, he wasn't doing a good job of what, what, what was happening with him. Mm. So, yeah, he walked away. It was sad because he was a brilliant, brilliant manager. Yeah, no. But like, like all managers, not everybody likes you, but, but he was a, a magnificent manager. Uh, somebody wanted to know which player made the biggest impression on you. That's Gavin, who was a big Leeds fan, but uh, liked you all the same during the 80s, he said. Uh, so, player that made the biggest impression on you. I don't know what he means by biggest impression. It was interesting you said Sunis was the best you played. Yeah, yeah well, that, that would be the one who made the biggest impression on me, Sunis. You know, I, I watched a lot of um, what he did in games and how he... You know, he had a... He had a Champagne Charlie had a nickname. Mm. People still call him that. We played and still call him Charlie. But he had this sort of aura of, you know, good looking lad, go to nightclubs and drink all night. But he wasn't, he was always, he always looked after himself for football. Um, he always presented himself well. 
And then when I watched him on the pitch, it's like, you know, his tackling, his passing, his, you know, he linked everything up and he was, he'd, he'd sort of pose around the pitch and look mm. at me, like what I can do. But um, magnificent player, magnificent player. Um, you know, you get the likes of Kenny being mentioned by loads of people above him. And Kenny was also brilliant. But, excuse me, soonest for me was the one that I, I was... Yeah, I was wanting to watch and watch Sooners and play like him. Because mm. I, I wasn't till I wasn't till I went into centre midfield then that I was able to sort of do a bit of what he could do. Yeah, yeah, and get the ball. Of what he could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I mean, it's pretty nice. It's an enjoyable way to football to play football to take it off the, the centre halves and pass it around and take it back. You know, I'm I'd love to do it now because all the midfielders get so much time. I've been watching some old games on television. Every time you get the ball, someone's after you, kicking you, booting you. Now again, it goes into midfield and everybody drops off, so you can just yeah, hundred percent pass straight going to the wide all the time would be great. Uh, so there's a text I wanted to mention it before I forget it. Boom, 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 boom. Oh yes, Johnny Dalton. I don't know if that name rings a bell. Ask Ronnie about the matches we used to play on the Keyhole Estate every Sunday afternoon. <laughs> well, so the big match used to be on Sunday, and all the kids straight after the big match would be on the road. And there was, a, there was a sort of a, a hill, not a huge hill, yeah. but we'd stop the cars coming up and we would get out and, and play every Sunday afternoon. Honestly, we were always football on the country side. There were loads of lads around. Um, again, it's the old thing of throwing the jumpers down and then we'll, go we'll have a game. Did your, yeah. did your dad get over to watch you play much for Liverpool? Yeah, he did. He was working in Aer Lingus at the time, so he, 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 was, he had some, some sort of scheme that Aer Lingus had that he could get flights over. Oh, great. So there was plenty of times he came over to watch me, yeah, which was which was good. Oh, that, that's magic. And would you in the players' lounge afterwards, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, he loved the whole thing of it. Yeah. Um, delighted that I was there. Um, he, he, he probably um, enjoyed the hospitality once um, too much and out of a game against Everton. And I got done by Eamon O'Keefe, who we played with with Ireland. Yeah. And I, Play the ball down with my left foot down the line, and Eamon O'Keefe come in and dumb me over the top and split me shin. And um, when I come into the, <laughs> into the players' lounge after the game, my dad come up to me and start trying to tell me how we, you've got to know what's happening on both sides when you're kicking that way. And I just wasn't in the mood to listen to him. No, no a sympathy. Couple of pints on him. <laughs> uh, when did you play your best football, Ronnie? You know, of those uh, what 15 amazing years at Liverpool, when were you really on song? When did you do your best stuff? 80, I would say 87, 88, 89, 90. Right. Um, that was when I really, 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 I enjoyed it all the time, but that, this was when I really, really enjoyed it. I was fit. Um, you had no problem getting around the pitch, no problem closing down. I felt, I'm never quick, but you, you, if you've got that extra little half a yard in your head, mm. you can get there before most people. But yeah, those four or five years in the late 80s that I really, really enjoyed and really, really felt I played well. I never, ever once got in a league team of the year, but I felt, I felt I'm playing some of the best football in my life in them five years. Yeah, yeah, they were great. The, uh, I, I read between the, reading between the lines of what Bob Paisley said, and this was a, this is this was in '86, but I, I guess it applies to those years you're talking about as well. I got the impression uh, he felt you were a touch underappreciated, maybe outside of those you were immediately playing with. Yeah, it was, but I, I, I was, I, I, I sort of liken myself to Jordan Henderson at this moment in time. Right. For the last couple of years. Not everybody gets what Jordan Henderson does, and not everybody got what I did. Mm. And I, I, I don't like it, but people say, "Oh, you only noticed how good he was when he wasn't there." Mm. And I, that was said about a lot about me when I, if I got injured, missed a couple of games, and everyone goes, oh, "I wish Ronnie Wheelan was playing." <laughs> but when I'm in the team, they went, oh, "I wish Ronnie Wheelan wasn't playing." So. I was appreciated. I, I know I was appreciated by the people I played with. Yeah, well, I guess that's the and, most and important they all thing. Felt they, yeah, for me and, and the manager. Yeah, well. Because you're not in the team if he doesn't pick you. So they always, well, and I was, I was nearly always picked for the 10 or 12 years I was, I was in the team. So they must have felt I was doing something right. And once they picked me, I know I was getting stick off the crowd sometimes at Anfield, but um, 
the manager picked me, so I felt I was doing something right. Yeah, well, six league titles, European Cup, uh, multiple League Cups, FA Cups, two World Cups, Euro 88, that would amount to a decent haul. Listen, our, our time is out, an hour is it by there in no time at all, Ronnie. Uh, thanks so much, much appreciated, great to hear from you. Loads of texts coming in to wish you well and uh, stay safe over in Liverpool. Thanks, Joe, thanks a million. Cheers, Ronnie Whelan there.